Hello, my name is Rachel Graham and I'm the health program manager for aging and caregiving at the National Down Syndrome Society. Uh, we partner with the National Keratoconus Foundation, uh, which is a patient advocacy program based in South Southern California at the University of California, Irvine. Um, NKCF provides information to patients and their families and raises public awareness of this cornea disease. Um, at NDSS, we're the leading human rights organization for all individuals with Down syndrome, and we envision a world in which all people with Down syndrome have the opportunity to enhance their quality of life, realize their life aspirations, and become valued members of welcoming communities. Um, I'm very excited to be joined today by Dr. Uh, Anne Ostrovsky, who is a cornea specialist and director of the Keratoconus Program at NYU Langone Medicine, and John and Mark Cronin of John's Crazy Socks. So thank you all for being here with us today. Glad to be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Perfect. So, Dr. Ostrasi, I'll get started with you. So, tell us why um, patients with Down syndrome and their families should learn about keratoconus. Okay, pretty good. Um, so, keratoconus is a progressive eye condition uh, that can lead to decreased vision and even blindness if untreated. Um, it is much more prevalent um, in patients with Down syndrome and than in the typical patient population. And sometimes, uh, symptoms of decreasing vision can be manifest um, with your child squinting their eyes or telling you that they cannot see clearly, but other times very mild visual decrease uh, can be subtle um, and your child may, may not be complaining. However, objective measurements um, of vision can be done at either your primary care uh, doctor's office or at your child's eye doctor's office. And so we can pick these up um, e even when they are subtle. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, and Mark, we'll jump to you. So how and when did you learn about keratoconus? Um, did you hear John complain, sorry, complain about changes in vision? Um, and what did you su suspect? Well, it took some time. Um, John did not have any trouble with his eyes when he was younger and was not really complaining. I mean, this is something that I think John does, and I think many people with Down syndrome do. They're used to adapting. So he was figuring out how to make things work, but we would notice him squinting and in conversation could tell he had some difficulty seeing some things. So that's when we took you for an eye exam where we first heard about keratoconus. Thank you. And John, uh, did you wear glasses or contacts? Or did you ever notice that it was when it was hard to see things? Um, I, I, it, it's same. Um, a lot of time in classes that I'm in um, Shanghai. Um, I, I was in uh, a Shanghai uh, first time, and um, I have trouble seeing through the classes. Uh, I, I I have trouble looking at a board, and then I uh, then I um, then I um, Wearing contacts. Well, but that was only after we found out about the current keratoconus. I, I, I find out, I find out, uh, a keratoconus, uh, by, by National Down Syndrome Society, I, at a summit, I, I hear from uh, Dr. Kresge, uh, a, a, a webinar. Well, you're jumping ahead of talking <laughs> about how Dr. Ostrovsky's your hero for saving you. Um, but that, I mean, our experience was, mm -hmm. you know, you heard about it and the information was a little confusing. Um, mm -hmm. The first person we saw made it sound as if there weren't a lot of things to be done for John. Um, so that's when you got contact lenses, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. they, you know, Dr. Osofsky could fill in details, but from our perspective, they were thick, hard contact lenses that were difficult to put in. And John, to his credit, spent months working to learn how to put them in and, in fact, work with the ophthalmologist on a system that looks like I, a, I, I, I really look like a, like a golf club thing, a golf a, a, a right? tee, and I, 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 I like inside. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, wasn't, 
I worked so hard on that, and I put on my custom. It's really easy he, he to lowers, put in. John lowers his head to put yeah. the contact in. Right. Um, we sent, we shared some videos of him learning to do that. Mm -hmm. You are there, do not let go. Keep pushing that lens, push. Remember like I showed you before? Oh. And it's in. Yeah, and way to in. go, way to go. <laughs> uh. <laughs> yes. Way to go, buddy. Yes. And you were so happy when you got that. I right? am so happy, I'm really happy. Yeah? Uh, well, perfect, well, we'll get to it. We'll I was going to say, we'll get to that in a second, because I know there's a few. Uh, John, I want to know the first um, time you met Dr. Ostrovsky and what you thought about the whole process. Um, I met Dr. Ostrovsky that, uh, from the uh, live webinar uh, uh, um, uh, I, I, at a summit, uh, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm excited. And Krasky talk about uh, talk about uh, I'm learning a lot. Uh, I'm I I get I get used to it and I, I loved it. It is it is really mm -hmm. helpful because mm -hmm. I, it helped me. Uh, I can see and um, it we're 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 incredibly grateful. It was NDSS that set up that that forum so we could hear from Dr. Osowski. And I remember watching it and then running and saying, John. We found the doctor, um, yeah, and and then that experience. And uh, I could talk specifically about Dr. Ostrovsky, but more general about what were is taking the time to really examine John's eyes and understand what was going on, and then taking the time to explain not just to me, but to explain to John what was going on. And what the options were, and that's not something you always get from a doctor. Is oftentimes we'll see a doctor, and the doctor will only talk to me or to my wife, as if John's not even there. But you're the patient. I am, and you know what's going on. Um, mm -hmm. So that really made a difference. Yeah. We love to hear that. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ostrovsky. So, when you um, talk to families about cross-linking and keratoconus, uh, what do you want them to know, and what are some concerns that they express? I think a couple of things that Mark and John just brought up is really important. One, the first thing that's really important is to actually get this condition diagnosed if it exists, right? So you have to be aware that there is such a condition, and then uh, make sure that you are asking your doctors. To, you know, specifically, does my child have this, this condition? Um, uh, the condition can be screened for uh, at your child's uh, general eye doctor, but sometimes it actually requires specialized equipment that maybe your general eye doctor doesn't have. And so you may need to see a cornea specialist to be able to, to diagnose the condition. The other thing that's really important is once you, if, if uh, and not everybody has this uh, condition, but if, if your child does have it, there is a possibility of attempting to improve vision. Like John said, you know, he went through a lot of pains to teach himself how to wear these hard lenses, these rigid contact lenses. Um, but in keratoconus, those can be very, very superior for visual improvement. Sometimes um, glasses have a finite life in keratoconus. You put them on and they're just not helpful. And when you get to that point, um, some people just give up and say, well, there's nothing you can do for the vision. But truly, uh, contact lenses um, in patients with keratoconus can be very helpful. And if the patient is motivated like John was, um, you really can uh, teach uh, how to, you know, teach the patient how to put them in, and then they could get it and, and benefit from it visually. The second mm -hmm. thing that's really important is, um, other than the visual improvement, um, the disease is progressive or can be progressive. And so it's important to figure that out. If the disease is stable, then nothing needs to be done and it can just be monitored um, and glasses or contact lenses can be used for vision. But if the condition get, is getting worse, if it's progressive, then we actually have an opportunity to stop the progression and stabilize the disease. And that's when cross-linking comes in and that's what we did for John. Um, and, um, you know, th this is a really great way for us to stop the progression of the condition and prevent preventing vision loss. Um, 
And the last thing I think that's really important is that every single patient is different and, and special, and it's important to treat every patient on a case-by-case -case basis. There is no algorithm, and I can't tell you that every single person who has progressive keratoconus should be treated with cross-linking, because for some patients, uh, that's not going to be the proper way to go. So I think it's very important to take uh, each patient, get to know them and their family, and make sure that you know we are proceeding according to what's going to make them better. Uh, I'd like to add two things or emphasize two things there. One, early diagnosis is important, and unfortunately, um, John, I think, is an example of what can happen. You know, one thing, and doctor, correct me if I'm wrong here, but one thing that happens is people will rub their eyes and that can make it worse. So if you can diagnose it earlier, you can change behaviors there. But second, and maybe you'll talk more about cross-linking, John had cross-linking done in one eye, but his other eye had progressed to the point where cross-linking was no longer an option. So if we had been more aggressive earlier, I mean, you'd have to get different parents. If we had been more aggressive earlier, maybe that would have been available to John. So that's important. The other thing is, and, and this was very uh, comforting to us, Dr. Ostrowski, after diagnosing John and working with John, said, this will not lead to blindness for him because we have options. And one of those options is a corneal uh, transplant. Not saying that that will happen, but we got told early on from a different doctor, John would never be a candidate for a corneal transplant. Well, that doctor didn't know John. And, and so what Dr. Ostrowski says, you have to treat the individual patient. That's really important. Absolutely. I really, I really do agree with that. And I think that's very important. The other thing, <clears throat> you know, for, for eyes that can no longer get cross-linking, eyes that are getting worse, that are not candidates for cross-linking, if they continue to get worse, Mark is right. You know, there, there, is, there are things that we can do for certain patients that can be, you know, can restore vision, can improve vision. So thank you for pointing that out, Mark. Yeah. No, thank you both. Um, so, John, I have a question for you. So, did you and your dad discuss if you wanted to have the procedure after meeting with Dr. Ostrovsky, and were you worried at all about what could happen? Um, I'm not. I'm not least worried. Uh, um, um, I'm not least worried about Patricia. Uh, I feel great. Well, let's see. We had a lot of conversation with Dr. Ostrovsky, who walked through every step of the way, and it was very clear, this won't hurt, but here's when it might hurt. It was very clear to you, and we had a lot of talk about it, discussion, right? So you made the choice to do it, and you say now you had no worries, but the morning, you <laughs> were a little nervous, right? I, I yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of a little bit nervous before <laughs> because I know it's the first time I, I I did that because because um I I I know it's going going to be a little bit hurt and um, well the procedure did the procedure hurt when you were laying back no no and we got those cool photos that look like lasers are coming out of your eyes oh I love that. <laughs> <laughs> And it sounds like Dr. Ostrowski of making John comfortable yeah. played your song list. Not one I would pick, but your song <laughs> list, right? Um, and now do you say, was it a problem? Would you recommend it to other people to help their eyesight? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We did a couple of other things as well. Um, sort of before we decided before we had all the conversations getting John ready for this condition, we actually took him to the room where the procedure was going to take place. We showed him a little instrument that we put into the eyelids that hold the eyelids open, which is probably one of the most uncomfortable portions of the procedure. And so we practiced ahead of time. 
Um, we also um, had John get some goggles and safety glasses that he would practice with um, because we wanted him to wear that after the procedure to protect his eyes and also practice putting in some, some eye drops. So I think you guys did some artificial tears, right? Yeah. In, in preparation for what it would feel like to put medicated eye drops that would be required for after the surgery. Wow, it sounds like you were really prepared. Right? She's pretty smart, knows what she's doing. Right. She's yeah. well, right. Right. Um, and and uh, whether I remember that, uh, that I uh, reach coming back home. Right. Um, I I I I I I I home. Right. And I'm doing I put in swaps my eye. Right. And I, mm -hmm. I after I'm doing my procedure, I feel a little uh I feel a little hurt a little bit. I kind of look up. Uh, I, I, I'm kind of out of it because I, I'm feeling a little, I'm feeling a little pain. Yeah, and you took a day off from work, which you rarely do. Right? <laughs> it turned out to be okay. And you don't really remember the pain, do you? Plus, if it got bad, I should have your foot. So then you were thinking about your foot, not your eye. Yeah. And the three students. <laughs> I know, right? right. Um, Dr. Ostrowski, can you explain um, a little bit about how the procedure works and uh, do you need to do special testing before the cross-linking? Sure. Um, so the way that the procedure works is that we um, expose the cornea, we soak the cornea in a vitamin B solution called riboflavin. Um, and then we expose that riboflavin soaked cornea to some UV light. And the interaction of the UV light with the riboflavin actually creates these str strong bonds in the cornea called crosslinks. And it gives the cornea, uh, makes it more strong and rigid. And this is what essentially stabilizes the condition and prevents it from, from the cornea from, the, uh, from continuing to deform, which is what happens in keratoconus. Um, the whole procedure takes about an hour. Um, and uh, we, we do do, before the procedure, we do do corneal topography measurements. Um, and those are basically, they will measure the shape of the cornea. Um, and they, that is the essential measurement that's needed to see whether you have keratoconus. And also over time, those are repeated to see whether the keratoconus is progressive or if it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And uh, so, John, I know Dr. Strafi told us you started wearing goggles after the surgery. Um, so, how long did you have to wear your goggles, if you remember, and how did you remember not to rub your eyes after the surgery? Do you remember? Um, you wore the goggles for a couple weeks. A couple, a couple of weeks. And that okay. helped you not to rub the eyes, right? And what do you yeah. still wear when you're outside? Sunglasses. You've got those cool sunglasses now, right? Oh, okay. And, and um, um, what I do remember wearing goggles, I I fall asleep with it. Mm -hmm. You wearing them going to sleep? Yeah. Or you just fell asleep wearing goggles? I wear goggles <laughs> having sleep. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. And, you're and, the, and and there were eye drops afterwards, right? And we had pain medication we could give you if you had a lot of pain, but we never used it because you didn't, you did not express having a lot of pain. I know pain. You were tough. Yeah. Yeah. You were good. Yeah. Uh, I just want to touch my slide. Uh, uh, I'm making my, my <laughs> eye go away. <laughs> yes. I'll be Mo, you be curly. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> and Mark, what do you remember of the day of the cross linking? Well, Dr. Ostrovsky already mentioned it. It was how well prepared that the doctor and her staff made John, right? Um, again, that's really important to pay attention to the actual patient. Um, mm -hmm. So ahead of time, John knew what was going to happen, right? We had been in the room. There is a device that holds the eye open. John had already felt that. He was used to getting the eye drops put in. So it made him comfortable. And it was only that morning on the drive in to, it takes an hour, hour and a half to drive in to uh, Dr. Sopsi's uh, office 
that John started getting nervous. And started kind of going down that spiral, but it was able to walk him through of, well, the doctor has explained this, you've already done that, to put him at ease. Um, and it, it was also important um, that she, that Dr. Ostrovsky let me be there during the procedure. So there were periods, particularly early on, when I was able to hold John's hand um, and we were able to talk throughout. So I think that's important of having a parent or a caregiver present with the with the patient. And and John, mm -hmm. as usual, was you know a rock star of okay, you're very good at following the doctor's orders. This is what you want me to do. I'll go and do it. Um, mm -hmm. You're glad you did it. <laughs> you are glad, right? That's amazing. Dr. Ostrovsky, it sounds like you and your team did an incredible job prepping, not only John, but Mark as well for for this. Uh, can you describe how long the procedure takes and a little bit about the anesthesia and how long you'll follow John as a patient and if it ever could be repeated as, as a procedure? Yeah, so the procedure takes about an hour, um, you know, between the removal of the surface layer of the cornea and the administering of the riboflavin drops and then the UV light, the whole thing is about an hour. Um, generally, for uh, all of my typical patients, um, this is done under local anesthesia with just eye drops for numbing. Um, with some of my patients who have Down syndrome, we try to do uh, topical or eye drop anesthesia, and John was awesome. And with practice and you know, with the support of his family, we were able to do this for him uh, in, the, in the office uh, with just eye drops. And he did amazingly, beautifully. Um, there are other patients that I have seen who uh, are unable to tolerate uh, you know, the speculum, the metal speculum that is put in the, in the eyelid or just you know, being still for an hour and um, having to, to look at one particular spot and, you know, on the machine. Some patients find that difficult, and so there are patients that we have taken and done this under general anesthesia, and that can be done um, in the hospital. Um, John is stuck with me. Uh, he stuck <laughs> with me, for and so I'll be seeing him a lot. And we are gonna, you know, follow his corneal topographies, the pictures of his corneas, probably twice a year um, until we are sure that he has stabilized. At which point, we may be able to switch over to once a year. Um, uh, but uh, this is going to be ongoing. Um, occasionally, generally the cross-linking works very, very well. Um, and as long as my patients don't rub after the cross-linking, which can cause progression of the disease okay. despite the stabilizing procedure, and John knows not to do that, um, yeah. generally it does stabilize in most cases. Um, occasionally there can be cases that do progress despite treatment. Um, and Again, we look at those on a case-by-case -case basis, and we do consider repeating the cross-linking um, if it's possible. Good. Thank you so much for that layout. I think it helps a lot with families who either are considering this or just learning about it, really how long the process takes and, and how to talk to their own doctors if they're not in, in your area um, to, to what their loved one needs and, and how this all could work. So I appreciate that. Um, so Mark, did um, did John experience any problems even in the coming days after the surgery? Everything was as expected. Um, oh. Pain that Dr. Ostrowski prepared him for. Um, while you had some discomfort, he was not in great pain. Um, so we had some backup, you know, significant pain medicine that John did not need. Um, yeah, and. And Dr. Strowski is right. It's like the end of Casablanca. We're going to be friends for a long time. Um, <laughs> and if I if I pull back and think about some general lessons, it's you know, one find somebody who knows keratoconus, who is intimately familiar. You know, you want a doctor who's dealt with a lot of these cases. And I know the keratoconus foundation and NDSS can compile a list of those. And part of, and the second part is find a doctor who's going to treat the patients and, and really pay attention 
and take care of the patient, and in this case, John. Um, those are the two key things. And, you know, here's a simple indicator. Uh, we're about an hour and a half from Dr. Ostrovsky's office. It's, yeah, I think the technical way to describe it, it's a pain in the ass going to the office there. <laughs> but it's worth it, right? You, you find somebody who can take care of you know, someone you care about, and, and it's worth it. And that's, that's the best way I can describe it. Yeah. And what would you say to parents who are facing the decision whether or not to proceed with cross-linking? Well, unless you've gone to medical school, what are you doing? Um, <laughs> you know, it, it, <laughs> listen, we, there's, and, and, and you, know, you both know this, um, a person with Down syndrome can face a series of medical challenges. As a parent, you find the best doctor you can, and then trust the doctor and follow the medical advice. Um, we're lucky to run a sock company. I can't figure out how to figure <laughs> John's eyes. Um, you know, we, we had something very early on in John's life. Um, like about half the people were born with Down syndrome. John was born with a very significant heart defect. He had two holes in his heart. And early on, we got a lot of conflicting information. But then we went and saw the right pediatric cardiologist, the Dr. Wilton Gersony at Columbia Presbyterian. And I remember sitting in his office and saying, we have a conundrum here. We don't know. You know we know John needs this operation, open heart surgery, but he has to be large enough and strong enough to withstand the operation. Yet he can't grow until he has the operation. We don't know what to do. We're trying to figure that out. And he looked at us and said, why is this your problem? That's what I would do. And so I use that as the example of, you know, to a parent, the best thing is get the diagnosis and get the right doctor and then follow the doctor's orders. You know, not blindly, but be part of the team. I mean, what's really great, among the many things great about working with Dr. Ostrovsky, he treats the patient, but we're all involved in the care plan. And, and that's, I think that's what you look for. Yeah, absolutely. As a group effort, absolutely. And John, we'll end with you. So. Um, we really appreciate you sharing this experience with us. I'm so happy that you all were able to meet Dr. Ostrowski earlier this year and that already a few months later, um, you're, you're being treated for keratoconus. But um, tell me what would you tell some of your friends if they were gonna go get um, this procedure done that you did? And what would you say to them if they were worried about it? Um, don't look at me. <laughs> What would you tell somebody if one of your friends came to you and said, I have keratoconus, John? What would you say? You'd say, well, go see Dr. Osowski. And if they said, well, I'm, maybe I'm going to have cross-linking, would you say that's a good thing? Uh, yeah. Yes? Were you happy you had it? Maybe I had it. Right? And I... I will remain um, uh, uh, other people uh, um, uh, go a particular. When you have something wrong, you know, a medical thing challenging, don't you always ask to see the doctor? Don't you always want to get treatment? You're always on my case about that, right? I do. Right? So don't you want to tell other people, go get treated? Yes. Uh, uh, um, I, I, I just go and treat it. Go so get treated. So get treated, and, so get treated and uh, uh, it's very important uh, your health. And I I think I I think I'll, I'll go see your doctor, and and uh, I I make I make you um see that. Right. Wonderful. 
some really good advice. I appreciate it, John. Um, all of your friends, John, to not rub their eyes. Okay. <laughs> right. Maybe, well, the, maybe we could get like foundation money to fly people who you know people who need treatment for keratoconus and if they have Down syndrome to fly them from around the country to see Dr. Ostrowski. Mm. Good idea. I'll, I'll ask the boss. I'd be very <laughs> happy to see. That. I love it. Um, well, Dr. Ostrowski, Mark, John, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I want to thank the National Keratoconus Foundation as well for pulling this all together. We're um, we're really happy to be partners, and I know a lot of people are going to benefit from not only this interview but our our other webinar um, next week. So. Again, so grateful to connect with you. I'm so happy that you all found each other. And um, yeah, it's been a great talk. And if parents uh, want to reach out, we'd be glad to uh, talk to folks. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Mark and John. Thank you, Good to see you. See you soon in the office. <laughs>